Hi and welcome to our Calculus 1 video on the rest of these limit laws. We have previously discussed and found these limits that I'm showing you now and then used some intuitive limit laws to progress through number 3 there. So that was the previous video. So now let's take a look at some of our algebraic techniques and how that's going to link to our table of values and to our graphs um, to evaluate these limits. So let's write down what those algebraic techniques are. All right, so first and foremost, if you can, like we were able to do in the first two problems, if you are able to just substitute in that value and evaluate the limit, that's the best path, right? So there's substitute, that's our main goal for every problem actually. Number two will be factor and reduce, you can call it simplify, you can also just call it rewrite because sometimes it's not always the most reduced form that we need. The whole purpose for factoring and simplifying or reducing is so that then you can substitute in the value that you want. Our third technique might be something to do with a common denominator whether it's the lowest or not and then we would reduce or again just rewrite. It may not be the most simplest looking um, rational expression at that time, but it may be enough where we can then substitute. And lastly, and again these are not in any order, these are just the four different techniques that you will use throughout Calc 1, might be rationalize. And notice I'm not saying rationalize the numerator or rationalize the denominator, I'm just saying rationalize because that leaves it open to both. Then you would reduce or simplify so that you can then substitute. And again, the result after rationalizing, for example, may not look any more simplified than the beginning. In fact, the beginning might look more simplified, but the reason that we do it is so we can remove that discontinuity and then substitute in that value. Now we also said in a previous video that you know you're going to need some of these algebraic techniques if when you substitute in the value, you get zero over zero. We'll talk about that indeterminate form later on in the semester as well. Okay, we'll talk about exactly what that means and, and everything that goes along with that. So for now, let's start question number four here and let's, I'm not, I'm not gonna write down the limit laws as they might appear in your textbook. What I'm gonna do instead is just apply some of these limit laws and apply these algebraic techniques that we're talking about here. So this is limit as x approaches zero. Notice it doesn't say from the left or from the right, so I have to look at both sides. And it appears that I have two rational expressions, I'm subtracting them both. But let's just try to substitute in zero and see where we get. Now, many people stop here and say, oh, well I substitute in zero, my first fraction's one over zero, that's undefined. Well, keep going, please. Minus one over zero squared plus zero is zero. And now I understand that both of these are undefined, but let's look at this. If we were subtracting fractions with a common denominator, we would keep that denominator the same. We would subtract across our numerators, leaving me with that zero over zero or indeterminate form. So I know that there's some algebra here that we need to do. So let's do that algebra. What would it be? Well, I tried substituting, right? That didn't work yet. Factoring, I can factor that denominator, right? An x can come out, but then it's not really changing the fact that that fraction is one over zero. So we think this is gonna have something to do with common denominators. So right now I see this as two separate rational expressions or two fractions that I'm subtracting. Let's try combining this as one fraction and see if I can then substitute in zero. Again, your ultimate goal is you want to be able to put that zero in in place of x. So keep the limit as x approaches zero in front of your whole problem, otherwise you only have an algebraic problem or a trigonometry problem. All right, so I have one over x minus one over, I'll factor that second denominator. Again, we want this to be a calculus problem, right? So we're evaluating a limit. You've done this algebra in previous courses. I am gonna show it all. You may do this in fewer steps, I'm not sure here. So I see that my common denominator, and I am gonna find the lowest, so I will label it as LCD, but I have common factors of x, then I need to include the factor of x plus one. 
So there's my common denominator. So I'm going to multiply the first fraction by x plus 1 over x plus 1. And the second fraction does not need anything. Again, you may have gone right to this next step here where you, don't forget your limit, where you already wrote them as one fraction combined. So if that's the case, I'll distribute the one. I know it doesn't change values, but it's a good habit to get into, especially if that's a negative one. And so quickly you might be here. Limit as x approaches zero of x over x times the quantity x plus one. And here's where some of us in the past have gotten into a little bit of trouble because we've said, oh good, x over x cancels. I'd like you to be very cautious about that canceling idea because sometimes you scratch things out and you mean a one, other times you mean a zero. So what I'm going to say is x divided by x is one, right? In other words, that's one x up there. So it leaves behind that factor of a one or they divide to be one. So that is the factor that I needed to go away because if x is zero, then I still have a zero in the numerator and a zero in the denominator. So it would still be zero over zero. So I knew that that factor of x was the one that I had to reduce or divide out. So now I'll rewrite what I have with limit here. Limit as x approaches zero of, all I have left is one over x plus one. And now I'm at the point where I can just substitute in zero for x. So it leaves me with the one over one, which is one. So I believe this limit to be one. So if I look from both sides, left and right, approaching zero, my y value or my function value should be approaching one. So let's take a look at our graphing calculator and see what we see. All right, so if I go to my y equals and I type in the original function, it is very important that you type in that original function. Because again, if I made some algebraic error, I want to know. So I'm looking at the original curve. If I go to, for example, my, I'm going to make sure my table set is set up in a certain way where I'm asking, right, for the independent variable. That way when I go to my table or second graph, it's waiting for me to type in those x values and I'm going to type in x equals zero and I should expect an error, right, because that's when we got that indeterminate form of zero over zero. But if I type in something just to the left of zero, well, what would be just to the left of zero? Negative point zero zero one, for example. And if I type in something just to the right of zero, or just a little bit bigger than zero, it'd be positive point zero zero one. And if I take a look at these two y values here, it looks like that one certainly is approaching one. And this one is approaching one. So I can say with pretty good certainty that yep, my function is approaching one. If it helps you see the visual graph, you can certainly do that. You may want to change your window. I don't need x going from negative 10 to positive 10, for example, because I'm only concerned with this one x value as x is approaching zero. So you may even just go to your window and say, I just want to limit x from negative one to one, so that way zero is centered here, and I'm just focused on this area. And oh, it looks like y equals one would be the limit. From the left, it's approaching a y value of one, and from the right, it's approaching a y value of positive one. Okay, so I think everything sort of aligns in that one to lead me to that answer of one. All right, and while we have our calculators handy, we're going to go ahead and take a look at this next one, and we're going to take a look at it graphically first, and then use our algebra to help us out. So first of all, this one has two minus absolute value of x in the numerator, and it has that two plus x in the denominator. So let's type that in our calculators, and I'll show you where that absolute value button is. So in my y equals for the numerator, I'm going to put parentheses, two minus. Now there's two places where you can find absolute value. You can go to your math menu, which is right underneath that green alpha button, math and you can arrow over to the numbers or numerical menu here. 
absolute value or ABS is the first choice. If you have the new software, it puts the absolute value symbol in there for you. If you have the old software, it literally says ABS followed by parentheses. So the only thing in my absolute value is that X. Be sure you arrow out or if you're an old software, be sure you close that parentheses for the X and for the absolute value and for that um, numerator. So I'll show you what that looks like here in a second. Divided by in my denominator is 2 plus X. And if you've played around with your window at all in the past, I would just say Zoom 6 is a fine place to start. But keep in mind too, I only want to surround X is approaching negative 2 and I want to approach it from the left and from the right. So I actually don't care about any of this part of the graph over here. I'm just looking, surrounding this value of X is approaching negative two. I like seeing my axes, so I don't want to lose the Y axis. So I might say something like negative four to one. I know that doesn't necessarily center things like you would like, but I like seeing the Y axis. It's just a personal thing. All right, so as X is approaching negative two, first off, it does appear that my left limit and my right limit are going to be equal. So I do believe I'll be able to evaluate this limit. So whatever that Y value is right there, it appears to be one, but let's see if it is, and if so, why it is, okay? I can also look at my table of values. I think that's very helpful. I'm gonna delete out the old ones. And I can say, you know, negative two, if I could just substitute it in right away, I would. Obviously I can't, right, because that would give me zero over zero. So I'll plug in something just a little bit less than negative two, so something like negative 2.001 and negative 1.999 would be a little bit greater than negative two. And it's not exactly one, although it's rounding it to one and making it look nice, or sometimes you might find it is exactly one. So we're going to use our algebra to determine if that was exact or not, okay? If you have the old software, when you go to your Y equals, this is what it's gonna look like. You'll have the parentheses two minus the ABS for your absolute value, which again was math and go over and then it starts the parentheses for you. You type in X, close the parentheses for the absolute value, then close the parentheses for your numerator, divided by parentheses two plus X. So that'll look the same. If you forget that absolute value is in that math menu, you do have an alphabetical listing of every function in your calculator. It's in your catalog. So I could say, go here, I'm just gonna go second, zero, see it says catalog in blue, so that means I need to hit the blue button to get that, second catalog. And the nice thing about absolute value is it's alphabetically the first function that you have, hit enter, because that arrow tells you which one you're going to select. So hit enter and it'll put it in your Y equals menu. Now I had to be in my Y equals menu to start with, right, but then it'll put it there for you. So your, your catalog is another way of finding absolute value. All right, so our calculator tells us we think this is one. And again, my table of values told me that if I chose 1.999 negative, this was one and negative 2.001, this was one, okay? All right, so algebraically, what are we gonna do? Well, let's think back to what is the absolute value of X, right? It is actually defined as a piecewise function. Can you define it? Well, let's think about this. If X is seven, what's the absolute value of seven? Seven. If X is three, the absolute value of three is three. If X is 1.9, the absolute value of 1.9 is 1.9. So it is itself when X is greater than or equal to zero. But now what happens if I input a negative number here? Absolute value is guaranteeing a positive result. So if I'm trying to put in a negative number for X, meaning X is less than zero, my output is actually gonna be the opposite of that value. For example, absolute value of negative four 
is positive 4. Right, absolute value of negative 7.2 is 7.2. So it's always the opposite in that case. So I have it is itself when x is positive or 0, and it's negative x when x is negative. All right, so if I use that definition, we are looking specifically at x is approaching negative 2. So if x is approaching negative 2, which part of this piecewise am I on? Well, and I hope you said this bottom one, right? Because negative 2, do that again, negative 2 would be down here. X is less than 0 because negative 2 is less than 0. So I'm going to be on that definition or that part of the piecewise definition. The other way to think of it would be to look at the absolute value function graphically. Look something like this and something like this. The absolute value graph, even though it appears to be that nice pretty graph, is actually two graphs in one. This is the line y equals positive x, and this is good for all values greater than or equal to zero. And this other line has a slope of negative one, or it is negative x when x is negative. Right, because on the left, here are all my negative x's, and on the right, those are all the positives. So, all right, that makes a little bit more sense to me now, too, because if I'm looking surrounding x equals negative 2, I'm on that left-hand side of that graph, or the negative x part. So I'm going to use the definition of absolute value to determine what this is. So this is still limit as x approaches negative 2 of 2 minus, so instead of absolute value of x, by definition, we said that if I'm on this bottom portion or the left side of it, it is equal to negative x. And now maybe we can see why this is equaling 1 already, because this will be 2 plus x over 2 plus x which no matter what x is, as long as x is negative here, then we can use that definition for the absolute value. My output should be positive 1. So I hope that one helps, especially with the absolute value, because I think sometimes we forget that absolute value is actually a piecewise function if you take a look at it. All right, so I hope you found this video helpful. and There will be one more video on logarithms and the greatest integer function, hopefully wrapping up some of these limit laws for you.